second lesson today comes to us from James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18. Once again, this will serve as today's sermon text. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good light, by deeds done and the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So the question that James is tackling today is this. Do our thoughts and feelings matter when it comes to our service? Does God care about what I'm thinking or what my motivation is when I serve Him? You might often hear someone brag about the fact that they didn't act upon the thoughts that they had. Sure, I thought about doing this bad thing, this wrong thing, breaking the rules, cheating maybe, but I didn't go through with it. I actually did what I was supposed to do. But on the flip side, you might hear someone even brag about this, that I did what the good thing I was supposed to do, even though really I didn't want to do it. Does our actions nullify our thoughts? Does the fact that we do what we're supposed to do nullify the fact that maybe we didn't want to do it? Or maybe we were grumbling as we did it? As long as you do what God wants you to do, then it's a okay. As I said, James is tackling this very thought. And James has to tell us that not only are our thoughts important, but if we're doing even the good things in life and our motivation isn't correct, if we're not thinking correctly, if we're doing it against our will, then our actions actually become worthless. Our thoughts are, can be, are judged so greatly they can nullify the good work that we actually did. James today reminds us that when it comes to following God, it's not just our actions that need to follow Him, but our thoughts need to follow Him as well. James, in verse 13, gets us started by talking about wisdom, and he's continuing a thought that started in chapter 2. James has been James really is tackling a lot of misconceptions that many people have in faith. James, first of all, started off by tackling people who claim to have faith but refuse to show it. James starts off by saying, if you claim to have faith, or if you claim to have wisdom, you better show it. You need to live that life. Those who claim to have faith, but then do the complete opposite of what they claim, really don't have faith at all. Your actions speak louder than your words. But now James is going into the other direction now. He's reminding us, though, it's not just actions that matter. We claim we have faith, and then we show that we have faith. That's great. But we need to also know, we also need to remind ourselves that our hearts need to be in, into it. And that's where he gets into verse 14, where he warns us. He tells us in verse 14, But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it, boast about it or deny the truth. In fact, he even goes on, he says, Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. If we do certain works, but our hearts are not in it, if we're not here to serve God, if we're not willingly serving God with all our heart, then what we did is devilish. It's from the devil. We didn't actually serve God. We served Satan, which is the last thing any Christian 
wants to do. And that's quite scary when we think about it, isn't it? Because how often do we do something because mom made me do it, or dad made me do it, or pastor said, I better be doing this, or I better be doing this because this is important. And then I would come and do it, and then, but I'm not really wanting to be here. I'm not really wanting to do this. I'm not really wanting to learn. I'm not really wanting to sit here and listen. And now God is telling you, if that's your attitude about it, well then, what you did is worthless. In fact, literally he called it a worthless evil. A serving of the devil. Now that's terrifying, isn't it? What does that do to everything we've ever done? That makes us have to double think about it. Double check everything, right? Sure, you went on that outreach thing. You did what Pastor wanted you to do. Spread God's word. You knew God wanted you to do it. You did it, but you really didn't want to do it. You had other things you had planned. And so you said, fine, I'll do it. But I don't want to. What is God telling you about that work? You sat in church and you listened to the sermon and you sang the hymns, but you had other things on your mind. You really didn't want to be there. You didn't really want it. What is God telling you about that? And then you come to Bible class and you really don't want to sit in Bible class because it's just, it's like school. No one wants to be in school. No one wants to sit and learn and hear a lecture and learn anything. What is God saying about that work then as well? It's quite scary, isn't it? It shows, first of all, we're not really living a wise life because a wise life doesn't, doesn't worry about what I want to do. A wise life is about what other people want us to do, what God wants us to do and willingly do it. If James says, the well, wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, good fruit, impartial and sincere. Those who are wise not only understand that they must do this, that they must reach the world, that they must be in church, that they must be in Bible class. But they also know why, and they're excited about it. Because it's an opportunity to serve. It's an opportunity to serve others. It's not about me, though I will get something out of it. If you go and spread God's word to somebody who doesn't know about Jesus, you're going to get something out of it because you get to do the work that God has called you to do. You get to play a role in saving souls. That's incredible. But it isn't about you. It's not why God is sending you. It's about the person who needs to hear it. And when you sit in church, and when you sit in Bible class, sure, you're going to get something out of it. Why? Because you're going to hear about all the great things God does for you, and how He loves you, and what. And you're going to learn more about that, so you can gain an even deeper understanding. But it's not about you. You're not here for you. You're here to encourage everyone else. You're here so that that, other, that person who sits with you in church feels confident to come again and to keep coming. Why? Because they know they're not the only ones who are coming. They're not the only ones who are supporting this. They're not the only ones doing the work. They know that someone else is going to be there with them. Someone is going to be there to support them, to help them learn, to help them understand better what God has to say. True wisdom never wants to be the greatest. And that was the problem with the disciples in the gospel lesson. Here Jesus is worried about saving the sin, saving us from the sins that we have committed. And what are the disciples concerned about? Who's going to be able to be great in God's eyes? And sometimes that's how we think. Sometimes we live life with the idea that as long as I get what I want, as long as the end is great and glorious, well then the means that I use are justified. The ends justify the means. And then there are some who even say, as long as I do what is right, it doesn't matter where my heart is, as long as what needs to be done gets done. And here God is here to tell us that that's the wrong way of thinking. In fact, it's the complete opposite of what he thinks. Now someone might argue, they might say, well, pastor, I got, a, I, got a, I got the job that I wanted. I got the promotion that I wanted. And who cares if I had to step on some toes? If I had to 
ruin someone's reputation. If I had to think of myself first, look at all the good I'm able to do. Look at how many people I'm able to help. Look at the schedule I'm now able to keep. I'm able to do all the things you want me to do. And so why is what I have so bad? And why is the method in which I got it so bad? God will be quick to say, I don't need you to cheat. I don't need you to step on toes. I don't need you to bend the cut corners and bend the rules. Not to serve me. In fact, that's not serving me at all. I want you to serve me first. And if that means you never reach your dreams in this life, if that means you never get the promotion, if that means you're never financially able to do great things for a congregation, so be it. I honestly don't need you to do that. God can keep a church open or close a church all on his own. He doesn't need people, and yet he still calls us to do it. Why? Because it's for us. Outreach is for us and for others. Bible study is for us and for others. Worship is for us and for others, not for God. The Old Testament. We, when we learn about the Old Testament, we learn about God's people. So often we hear God railing on the people of Israel. There he's telling them, you're not faithful. You're not doing what I want you to do. You're, you're, you're going to be deported. I'm, I'm angry with you. I'm upset with you. You've broken my commands. But did you know that that whole nation, that whole people, they went to church every Saturday. They gave their offerings. They did the sacrifices just like God had prescribed. Me. They did all of that. In fact, many times when the prophets are yelling at them, it's while they're coming into church and while they're leaving church. On the outside, these people look great. That church looked healthy. But what was their problem? Their hearts weren't in it. They weren't doing the sacrifices because they loved God. They were doing it because that's what they were supposed to do. That's what looked good. God doesn't care about what we look like or how it looks or what, how often we come to church or how much offerings you've given or anything like that. He cares about where your heart is at. Are you giving your offerings because you love God and you want to be cheerful givers? Are you in worship because you love God and you want to hear what God has done for you? Are you in Bible class because you know that by doing so, you're going to become smarter in God's word and therefore your faith is going to be strengthened and while you're there... You're going to be serving the needs of others by encouraging them to stay longer. Encouraging them to be there. If that's our motivation, then we have true wisdom because then we're truly submissive, then we're yielding, then we're thinking of other people before we even think of ourselves. And that's the heart that God wants from us. And too often, none of us have it. Too often it's about my schedule, my needs, my wants. What fits with me? Sounds impossible, doesn't it? Sounds scary, doesn't it? Because what does that do for us? How does God look at us now? If our hearts have, are hardly ever in it. If our hearts are never really pure. Because can we ever really say that we've been 100% unselfish in anything we have ever done for God? And the answer is no. So what does that mean for us? Are we all in trouble? We're all going to hell? We know that we should, but again, we know the answer, right? We know that we're not. And what grace is that? How amazing is that? That despite even our best efforts, we'll never be able to serve God with our whole heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our actions. And God is still willing to forgive us. In fact, he does. And he has. We are completely forgiven of all our sins. From those times we never put our heart into it, to those times we barely put our heart into it, to those times we most of the way put our heart into it, all of those times have been completely forgiven. Forgiven by a God who gave us his complete heart, who yielded and was submissive to the will of his Father. Why? Because we needed him. It wasn't about Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit. It was about you. And what you needed from him. You needed salvation. I needed salvation. I need to be saved for the sins that I have committed. For every time that I have preached a sermon and my whole heart wasn't into it. For the times that I taught a Bible class and my whole heart wasn't into it. Or the time I knocked on people's doors or visited with people and I really didn't want to do it. 
I have been forgiven of all those sins, not because of anything I deserve, but because of everything God has done for me. And the same goes for each and every single one of you. God has completely forgiven every single one of them because he gave his life for you. He gave you everything so that you not only can be confident that you are saved, but that you can be confident that as you leave this world, when that day comes, we're going to heaven. And then where God will actually have the nerve to look us in the eye and say, well done, good and faithful servant. Because it isn't because we know the truth. We haven't been good and faithful. And yet God, because of his grace, because of his mercy, and because of the holiness Jesus has given to you, you're holy in his eyes. You're perfect in his eyes. And that's because your sins are completely washed away. And that's the only way our minds are going to be anywhere near what our God wants it to be, is by remembering that. Because if all we think about is what I have to do or what someone's making me do, it, well, then our minds are never going to be in it. It's only going to be Jesus' perfect sacrifice for you that is so undeserved that's going to remind us, this is why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to say thank you to my God who has given me everything. And because he has given me everything, I want to give him my everything. That's the only way. If Jesus is front and center, and it's his grace that's front and center, then our hearts will be in the right place. Our hearts will be there to serve. We won't be worrying about greatness, because we'll be worrying about God's greatness, and his mercy, and his desires, and his will. And in those times, when, even when that, we don't do that perfectly, once again, we know. We have a God who's forgiven even that sin. And because of that, we will be able to go to heaven and be considered great in God's eyes because he is so great. Amen. Please rise.